Hey guys, welcome to the channel. Thanks for joining me again. So today we're going to be discussing multi-row tracked panoramas. Now this is going to be a game changer for some of you guys. If you've just got yourself a tracker and you've already done multi-row panoramas on a fixed tripod, having the ability to get incredible low noise detail with a tracker, as well as being able to stitch really large format panoramas is an absolute game changer. So I think we better start with how you would normally shoot a panorama on a fixed tripod. So for anyone who's shot a panorama before, this is not gonna be anything new. So what we're gonna do is level the tripod up, which means our ball head's nice and level. Now from there, we can just pan across, take a photo, and depending on how, how quality your lens is, and if you don't have vignetting and any sort of, any sort of um, distortion or that in your lens, you can overlap anywhere from 30 to 50%. So you would take a photo, overlap, take a photo, overlap, take a photo, so on, so on. Now that's pretty straightforward. Now that changes a little bit as we get into the world of tracking mounts. Now, as we know, we've got a polar align our tracking mount, which means our tracking mount is actually gonna be pointed up. Now, for me, that's at about 32 degrees, and that will obviously change depending on where you're located in the world. Now, the things, the things that come with this tracker is a declination bracket, and then just a basic ball head adapter. And if you put a ball head adapter straight on the front of this tracker, the base of that ball head is gonna be laid back, for me, 32 degrees. Now the issue for that is we don't have a level base to start off and if we go to pan across to take a panorama it just won't work. Um, so some people try and undo the ball head and do it and pan across and it's an absolute nightmare. So what we've got to try and do first and foremost is get ourselves a level base to start from. And the way I've done it here is just by a simple Z bracket and I'm using the move shoot moves that bracket here and as you can see it mounts onto the ball head adapter and it just means that I can lift this up and down and get myself a nice level platform and this is the first step we need to do in order to take tractor panoramas. So the second thing to consider when we're talking about tractor panoramas is what actually happens when we turn the turn the tracker on. Now, like I've just, just shown you, we've got a nice level base to start with. Now, if I didn't have the tracker turned on, great. We can pan this around, shoot a panorama, happy days. But all that changes just a little bit as soon as we turn the tracker on. Now, as you can imagine, as we turn the tracker on, it's gonna rotate <clears throat> and follow the sky. Now, as it does that, we've just lost our level base. So what we need to do after every single exposure we take, depending on how long that exposure is. So for me, my normal go-to exposure length is three to four minutes long, which means for me, after every single exposure, I will need to level the camera back up before panning across. And the reasons for that is pretty obvious. If I go to pan this across now, it's just gonna pan straight down into the ground and not follow a nice, level, a nice level path across the sky. So for me, I will turn the tracker on, take an image, and then after that's done, level the base back up, then pan across, and then go again. So some of you smart cookies out there would have figured out by now that as the tracker, uh, as the tracker tracks around, as you're taking an image. As you level your base back up, your camera isn't in the same spot it was in regards to the sky. So you're not actually shooting a dead level line. You are actually shooting a stepped line. Now that's, that's absolutely fine. Now, if you think about it, if we're shooting three minute exposures, our camera might have only slewed a degree or two. I'm sure you mathematicians out there will let me know. But the point is, it doesn't move far enough for the software to have an issue with it. Now, obviously, on the top of your image and the bottom of your image, 
you're going to have slight steps in it and very, very slight steps. And later on, I'll show you an example of that. But in the whole center of the image, it doesn't make a difference at all because the next row covers that step. So we don't have to worry about the steps in our images. As long as we can keep panning across level, we don't have any issues with stitching them together. And when it comes to blending the foreground with our sky, that's where you get rid of that step at the bottom. And I'll show you that step. It's not significant at all and it's, it's definitely not, not an issue. So I think it's a fair time to discuss my setup here and, and how I find it works well for me. Now, I'd just like to point out that this is what works for me and there's a lot of, lot of other ways out there that you can do this and this isn't the only way. Now what you'll see other people do is mount a ball head on the ball head adapter that goes to another ball head that goes to the camera and yes that will give you a level base to work off um, and if you've got multiple ball heads already at home you're laughing you don't have to do anything else um, i would highly suggest buying some high quality z brackets so you get a similar setup to this and i'm in no way affiliated with move shoot move but these z brackets that they've come out are just killer they're the best Z brackets I've ever seen and I've used a few of them before I actually went away from Z brackets I used to have a setup very similar to this but what I found was there was too much movement and they couldn't hold the weight of a big lens or a heavy lens for that matter now if you're shooting with a DSLR a cheaper Z bracket off eBay or Amazon or those sort of things it just won't work now the difference is with these move shoot move Z brackets is you can crank them up and they stay cranked up. They're not relying on the friction between the Z bracket plates. These actually crank up and they will hold your camera. I'm not a little dude and I could probably stand on it. I mean, they're just awesome. And the range of motion that it gives me is just incredible. So I can do all different angles. I can slew this way, slew that way. And because I'm using two Z brackets, it means as the camera has moved due to the tracker, I can also level it back up this way. Now that we've got the easy stuff out of the way, gear wise, hardware wise, we're gonna to start to get into the more nitty gritty stuff when it comes to shooting really long multi-road panoramas. Now, for you guys who have shot panoramas before, doing a simple fixed tripod panorama is very similar to this stage. Now, most ball heads and three-way heads are going to have angles on them. So as you can see here, we've got angles. Now what's going to make your life a lot easier out in the field is if you know how many angle or how many degrees is 50% overlap. So when you're out in the dark, you don't have to look at the camera and try and look at a star and say, oh, that's about 50%. All you need to do is go... I know if I move 15 degrees, that's 50% overlap. Bang, 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 you're laughing. And that's the easiest way to do it and to guarantee that you're getting your overlap exactly the same every time. Now, the second part of the overlap process is obviously overlapping between your multiple rows. Now, unfortunately, this is not as simple as working out how many degrees to go up. And if you've got a panorama head that gives you degrees, that's fine during daytime or any, any time you're doing really fast shutter speeds. When you're talking three, four minute exposures, it's just not going to work. And the reason for that is if you've shot 20 images wide, well that's a lot, 10 images wide at five minutes, it's almost been an hour to do that single row. Now, the sky has moved up or down depending on what, what time of the season it is almost 15 degrees in that time. So what that means is, if you pan up your normal 50% overlap, you're not actually gonna get 50% overlap. You're either gonna get way more than that, or way less than that. And that's a real big issue, especially if you start pushing it the other way towards, you know, a 30% overlap. You might actually not get any overlap at all, and you will have gaps between your rows, and your image is ruined. <clears throat> So what we need to do is go into the camera and pick a star, preferably a bright one. Now it doesn't matter where it is, 
we're finished shooting our first row, so it doesn't matter where you pan the camera, as long as you can see a star in the in the live view, and you move the camera up or down 50%. Lock it in, go back to the start, and start shooting your second row. Now that will be the same for your third row, to go up, shoot your third row. I hope you guys are still with me. I know I've been waffling on a lot, um, but I'm glad you're still here. So we've discussed a lot here about, you know, what hardware to use, the techniques we use to shoot multi-row panoramas. And there's only one, one thing I'd add to that, and that's the, the technique about how we actually, or the order we actually shoot our images in. Now, if we think about how how much time we invest in a track panorama, we can start to pull apart how we would shoot that panorama. Now what I mean by that is, if we were to shoot at 35 millimeter focal length and each exposure is gonna be three minutes and we're gonna shoot a 40 image panorama. Now you can start to see that we're getting into the multiple hours now in, in acquisition. Now what that means is, the Milky Way is going to move a fair distance. Now you're not going to stop at 35 millimeters. I know that it's going to keep pushing. You'll shoot one at 20 mil, love it. You're going to shoot one at 35 mil, love it even more. You're going to go to 50 mil. You're going to go to 85. And the sky's the limit. You can just keep shooting longer and longer focal lengths. There's, there's, the sky's the limit. Now the problem with that is, if you still want to shoot a horizon to horizon panorama at a really long focal length, you're going to start getting into the multiple hundreds of single images per panorama. Now the problem with that is to acquire 200 or 300 single images for a panorama that's on a tracker and to utilize you know the advantage of having a tracker you're going to want to shoot long exposures so you might be shooting anywhere from four, five, six hours to shoot a panorama. Now that might blow a lot of people's minds, but you can actually do it, and you just need to strategically start your panorama in the right plot in the right place. Now, the example I would give is for me here in um, in Australia. At the end of the season, the Milky Way is going to set in the southwest. Now, the Milky Way the Milky Way core might still be a long way overhead, but in five or six hours, it's going to be down down right on the horizon. So if I started shooting that panorama from the top and working my way down, I'd never get there. I would never do it. So I would shoot it the opposite way. I would shoot it at the point that's going to disappear first. So I would start at the southwest horizon, shoot along the horizon, and then go back to the start and shoot my second row that way. I wouldn't start at the top and I wouldn't actually zigzag up because by the time you've gone across, up, and zigzagged back, too much time has passed and that part of the Milky Way would have set. So I would start in the southwest horizon, shoot across, go back to the start, up, shoot across, up, shoot across. And that way the Milky Way is coming down as you're shooting up and you'll meet somewhere in the middle. And that's how you can go five, six hours and shoot one single image and have it all stitched together. So as you can see here, I've jumped over into Photoshop and I just wanted to do this to show you guys the steps I was talking about in the image. Now, like I said, as we level up our camera, after it's tracked around, we're not actually um, going across a level line and there's actually steps in the image. Now, this is not an issue um, this is not an issue and, and here is you can see why. So here we can see a step in the image and this is another step in the image and like I said we only get them in the top and the bottom. Now on the top I've cropped out I've cropped out the steps on the top but as we zoom in you can see there's a step there. So we can see there we've got a step in our image and as we can see it's so close to the horizon here that as we blend our foreground in all those steps disappear. 
Now, if we, if we go up and have a look at the sky, there's going to be zero steps in this sky. Now, this is just the raw files stitched together. And there's zero stitch marks or steps in the image at all. And you can see here, it's just had a bit of a wobbly, but that's fine because as we mask our foreground in, that disappears. And here's another step here on the horizon, that'll also disappear. So for those of you guys who were thinking that there was gonna be some major steps in the image and that it's a big issue, it's definitely not a big issue. And this is another reason why we shoot a fair bit of foreground in our sky as well. So we can hide those steps behind our foreground. And what I will do later on is a full start to finish um, tutorial on how I capture, stitch, and then edit together a large format panorama like this. Thank you so much guys for joining me again here. I really do appreciate you um, checking out my channel and for those of you guys that have subscribed and liked my videos, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I hope that's helped you out a little bit. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback and I'd love to hear from you guys letting me know what you want to see. Like I said, I'll do a follow-up video to this which will be a start-to-finish, in-depth video which will include the stitching and the editing of a large format panorama. But I wanted to get this out for you guys so you can get out there, get shooting um, with your large format panoramas and when I get the next the next episode up which will be about the editing part of it you should have some raw files there ready to go anyway until next time cheers